Hey guys, welcome back to chapter eight, where we're going to talk about aquatic biodiversity. Chapter seven, we talked about land biomes. There aren't really aquatic biomes. We just don't break them down that way, but that's what we're going to look at. The aquatic ecosystems and how they impact us and how we impact them. Right off the bat, we're going to dive into a core case study. Coral reefs. Why should we care? Well, coral reefs are some of the world's oldest and most diverse, along with some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Especially when we're talking about history of the planet, coral reefs were providing life and diversity before there was ever anything on the land doing anything. Coral reefs only form in clear, warm coastal waters in the tropics. So it's got to be pretty much in this 30-30 band. 30 south to the equator at zero, up to 30 north. This is where we find coral reefs. They are formed by tiny little animals. We call them polyps. And the little single-celled algae that go along with them, they have this mutualistic relationship. So the polyps secrete calcium carbonate. That's what we see. We see that hard outer shell, but the little teeny tiny animals are the polyps that come in and out of those. But those carbonate shells are what become the coral reef, providing lots of places for other animals and fish, etc., to live in and amongst. A lot of hiding places and life goes on. So these coral reefs provide a very important ecological and economic services. They prove as a natural barrier to protect the coastline. So there's a storm where well, the energy from the wave gets disrupted by the coral reefs before it comes inland. So the coral reefs wind up protecting the shore a lot of times. It provides habitat and food and the spawning grounds for up to one-fourth to one-third of all of the ocean's organisms. So something might live out in the deep ocean, but a lot of them come in to spawn in the coral reef area to begin. So things begin their life there until they get large enough and big enough and then venture out. And some stay in the coral reefs their whole lives. So the spawning ground is very important for our world oceans. But the coral reefs are very vulnerable to damage, whether it's soil runoff, uh, climate change. They have to have a pretty narrow temperature range, too hot or too cold, either way can damage. And the increasing of the ocean's acidity as we have more carbonic acid, more sulfuric acid, and more nitric acid dissolving into the ocean from pollutants in the air, this acidification is weakening some of the corals and even killing others. So they've been very prone to damage by humans as well. From there, we'll dive right into chapter 8.1, Aquatic Systems. Now this chapter is broken down into five sections. Very simply, we're gonna talk about things that are true for both saltwater and freshwater. Then we're gonna look specifically at saltwater and how humans impact it, freshwater and how humans impact. So section one is broad in that it applies to both freshwater and saltwater. So the terms here are going to be applied for the rest of the chapter. So make sure you get these. Most of them you're familiar with. It might just be a name you're not sure of. Here we go. The saltwater and freshwater aquatic life zones cover about three-fourths of the Earth's surface. So, the things that determine life in an aquatic system, doesn't matter if it's freshwater or saltwater, there are four items that everything in an aquatic ecosystem depends on. And depending on how much of these things are present dictates how many and what kind of organisms are there. Temperature. Some things can't survive in cold water, some things can't survive in hot water. So temperature is a key factor. The amount of dissolved oxygen. Typically, the closer you are to the surface of the ocean, the more oxygen there is. So we tend to have more life in these shallow 
highly oxygenated waters than we have in the deep, lower oxygenated waters. The availability of food, nutrients that are there, and access to light. So sunlight winds up being. Typically what happens, if there's a lot of sunlight, then we can have producers, things that convert the sunlight into a food source. Then you have things eating them and you have things eating them. So typically, the sunnier, the warmer it is, the more food will be there and the more dissolved oxygen. So by and large, warmer, shallow areas have more life in it than deep, cold, dark areas. But those four, make sure you remember those four. Temperature, dissolved ox oxygen, the availability of food, which we can just call nutrients, and access to light, sunlight, how sunny it is. Typically, the more sunny, it's warmer, there's more food, and since it's shallow, more oxygen. Now, water covers most of the planet. Salt water, 71%. Guys, you may have heard three-fourths of the planet, blah, blah, blah. At this stage in the game, make sure you know the real numbers. 71% is salt water. About 2% is fresh water. So 73% of the world is covered in water. 71% salt water, about 2% fresh water, as we're talking rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, etc. Salt water, the ocean, we divide it into five areas. Technically, these things are all completely interconnected and they're all one thing, but we simply refer to it as five basic areas. We have the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Arctic, the Indian, and the southern. So we refer to these five large areas. Now people will talk about like Gulf of Mexico, but that's just part of the larger Atlanta. We'll break it down into smaller, but these are the five that we tend to actually refer to. Atlantic, Pacific, Arctic, Indian, and southern. So those five we need to know. Now the distribution of the organisms within this are largely determined by salinity. Okay? We have saltwater life zones and we have freshwater life zones. So saltwater life zones may also be referred to as marine life zone. Saltwater, marine, exact same term, means the same thing, and those terms are interchangeable. So our saltwater life zones are going to be the ocean itself, Estuaries. Estuary is where fresh water meets salt water, and we have a very rich life diversity there, but that comes into the salt water area. Coastlines, coral reefs, and the mangrove forest. Mangrove forest, mangrove swamps, you'll hear both terms, but those are the life zones in the salt water. The ocean itself, estuaries, where the fresh and salt water meet, the coastline itself, everything right up now where the tide is hitting. Coral reefs, clear, shallow, tropical areas, and the mangrove forest. And mangroves we also find in the tropical areas, but near the shoreline, but different than a typical coast where the waves are lapping. Freshwater life zones. Freshwater life zones are gonna be very simple. The rivers, lakes, streams, and wetlands, but specifically inland wetlands. If it's right at the coastline, that's an estuary and it hits the ocean. So wetlands, swamps, but they have to be away from the coastline. So that makes up our fresh water. Lakes, rivers, streams, wetlands. To both of these systems, whether it's fresh water or salt water, aquatic species, they either drift, swim, crawl or cling. And we have some different names for these organisms. And you need to be able to reference them by these proper names. Right off the bat, we'll talk about plankton. Now, plankton is a large category that gets broken up into three separate categories. Two are mainly talked about, but there are three. 
Plankton. Plankton are drifters. Yes, I know, you're thinking about plankton from SpongeBob. But they're actually drifters. They're not walking around the place. The microscopic organisms tend to be single cell, but also microscopic. They're not always single cell. And we're going to break them into three broad categories. So they're all drifters. They might be able to swim up a little bit, but they can't swim against a current. So we call them drifters because they have to move. If the current's carrying them that way, that's where they're going. They might be able to move up and down some, but the current's going to carry them away. They can't swim from here to there, just up and down a bit. So plankton are drifters, three types. The first are phytoplankton. This is the base of the food chain. Like some algaes would fall into being phytoplankton. So these are producers. They're producing their own energy from the sunlight. Obviously, they have to be close enough to the surface to convert the sunlight into energy. Many types of algae, and once again, they are the primary producers. They are the base of the food chain. Then we have what we call ultraplankton. These are also photosynthetic, very much like the phytoplankton. They're just smaller. So it's almost like this subcategory. We have the phytoplankton and what we call ultraplankton. And these guys are simply tiny. Micro, these are all microscopic, single cellular, very, very small. They form a part of the chain really for some of the more, the next one, the zooplankton. Zooplankton are animal-like. They're secondary consumers. They are feeding by and large on either the ultraplankton or sometimes the plankton. But the zooplankton are eating these ultraplankton and then other things are coming in to eat the zooplankton. The zooplankton, they range from single cell all the way up to like jellyfish, because jellyfish are drifters. They can swim up some, they can swim down some, they can kind of move a little bit side, but they can't swim against a current they are carried by the larger current. So if one's in the jet stream coming up the Atlantic, it rides it all the way up and around. So zooplankton, most are microscopic, as we have pictures of some up here, but they can be as large as our friend, the jellyfish. Plankton, ultraplankton, zooplankton. Plant-like, animal-like, very small creatures that make up the base of the food chain. Then we move into our next term, necton, strong swimmers, all right? Anything that can swim against the current. This is gonna include fish, turtles, whales, dolphins, shark, you know, anything that is a strong swimmer is referenced as a necton. The next one is a benthos. And yeah, the classic, the call in, Hello, is this the Krusty Krab? No, this is Patrick. <laughs> Patrick is a benthos. He's a bottom dweller, crawls along the bottom. Now the benthos, these are gonna be things like oysters. Now they may attach to the bottom, but they're still bottom feeders. Sea stars like Patrick the starfish, but he's crawling around to find food. Clams, lobsters, crabs. So these might crawl, cling, but they're our bottom dwellers. Some just attach to the bottom and stay there, some cruise around it, and some walk around it. Depends. And then decomposers. Now decomposers are largely bacteria. Benthos are on the bottom and they might be eating something that's dead, but they're not really a decomposer. They're consuming it really themselves. A decomposer is breaking it down so that the other nutrients can go back into the ocean. So a decomposer is a really a different role than a benthos. Benthos is just a bottom dweller, feeder, and it might be eating things that have died, but it's not truly decomposing, it's not breaking it down into smaller pieces that other things can use. We have plankton, nectin, benthos, decomposers. Those make up our four broad organisms that we have. And it takes us back. Remember the key factors in the types and the numbers of organisms. Sunshine, 
temperature, availability of food, and oxygen content. As a general rule, the shallower and warmer the water, the more organisms live there. The deeper and colder the water, fewer organisms because there's less oxygen, less nutrients. The last thing that is brought up that's important is what we call turbidity, the cloudiness of the water. Once again, coral reefs have to be in clear water. The sunlight has to be able to penetrate through. So if the water becomes cloudy for whatever reason, we can't have a coral reef. Where I grew up in South Carolina, the water was always turbid. It was always cloudy. You would stand in the ocean and you couldn't see down more than a foot or so. Cloudy water. You go in the waters off of Florida and depending on how far down you get, but even here near Gainesville, up around Jacksonville, a lot of times the water is pretty clear, five to six feet deep. You get down farther south, you definitely get below Daytona and you get into West Palm in this area and the water is wonderfully clear. Turbidity, the degree of cloudiness in the water is one of these main factors. That wraps it up for section one. Remember, section one, what we talked about, applies to both saltwater and freshwater organisms. So make sure you have those terms down. We'll see you next time when we talk about marine aquatic systems. Take care, guys.